title of the panel is Historical Blocks, and as argued, argued by Gramsci, the concept of historical block refers to historical connection between material forces, state and civil institutions, and ideologies, or to put it differently, an alliance between different classes, politically organized around hegemonic, uh, hegemonic ideas that give coherence to its elements. Uh, our panel will focus on historical blocks in post Yugoslavian countries, uh, trying to locate their similarities and differences. Uh, through analysis of post-socialist transition, uh, we will try to shed light on concrete alliances in Slovenia, Croatia and Serbia. And by examining the connection between economic interests and cultural and ideological leadership, over the allied and subordinate groups in these historical blocks, uh, we will try to detect the relationship between the dominant class and the weakest link of the alliances. And uh, of course, we will try to emphasize the political dimension for the progressive left movements uh, in this region. Um, I'm very glad to welcome with me today um, from my left to right, um, first Pogne Kojanic, He's a postgraduate student in uh, Central European University in Budapest and also a member of Center for Social Analysis in Belgrade. And next to him is Ane Korsika, uh, a member of Institute of Labor Studies, the organizer of May Day Conference, and also the member of Initiative for Democratic Socialism. And next to me is Marko Kostanic, um, a member of Editorial Collective for uh, newly found critical um, web portal built in and also a co-founder and member of Center for Labor Studies in Zagreb. Um, okay, um, this is more or less it. Uh, um, after each contribution, we I expect a lively debate, so uh, I won't be wasting any time. And uh, please, Ognan, the floor is yours. Thank you. I want to thank uh, the Institute for uh, Labor Studies for inviting me here and for all the organizers for, for this good conference. And without uh, much ado, I will start with my presentation. So, uh, the title is Discipline, Dispossessed and or Disorganized, Three Cases from Post-Socialist Serbia. And without going into theoretical elaboration, I will assume that the state plays a big role in fortifying and reshaping a historic bloc while labor unions are the main element in the civil society that can challenge it. So let me start with two quotes that describe the state of union activism in post-socialist Serbia. Quote, there is almost complete agreement among labor researchers, union officials, rank and file union members, and the general Serbian public that the working class in the 1990s was divided and disorganized and that trade unions were weak and without any real influence. Workers have simply been unable to organize collectively or decisively for any serious purpose, regardless of their individual preferences. And the, book, and the second one is, the strikes that took place in Serbia after 2000 were more frequent, had massive participation, were better organized, but less efficient than the strikes that had taken place before, or the strikes that took place in the neighboring countries. The transition and privatizations, privatizations are virtually finished. The workers are marginalized and the publicly owned companies are waiting to be sold and public services reformed. The biggest mistakes labor unions made were and continue to be the dependence on the state and entrepreneurs in the material sense, in cadre selection, and in the ideological and political sense. The consequence of this is the lack of solidarity, an insufficient level of support to the workers who fought privatizations with strikes and protests. And of course, the first quote is from a chapter in an edited volume dealing with labor in post-socialist Eastern Europe, and it was published in 2001. The second was from an article on labor unions and strikes, published in 2013. So the overall conclusions are pretty similar with regard to the strength of unions, and we could say almost identical. Uh, both identify the problematic legacy of union activism, or the lack thereof in socialist Yugoslavia and the politicization and involvement in the nationalist project during the 90s, as well as the institutional framework that allowed their fragmentation from the 90s onward. 
What is the, to quote from the panel, description? Historical congruence between material forces, state and civil institutions and ideologies that gives rise to a situation in which unions play such a marginalized role. To sketch out the answer to this question, I will focus on processes that I call disciplining, dispossession and disorganization. I will discuss three cases that can show some of the elements of contemporary class struggle in Serbia, which are to a certain extent determined by these processes an enterprise where the privatization process was successful and the enterprise continued working, which is Fiat Automobile Serbia in Kragovic. The second is an enterprise where the, the two privatizations were unsuccessful and workers continue fighting for their claims to ownership and salaries, which is the case of Yastr, but in Niš. And a state-owned enterprise that is undergoing restructuring, which is the case of Serbian railways. So some caveats. I do not claim that these examples are representative for these three broad categories of enterprises. However, they can be used to sketch out some elements in the process of disciplining, dispossession, and disorganization in post-socialist Serbia. My argument is that we need to understand the conjuncture of these processes in order to conceive of the broader processes underway in Serbia and in the region. In other words, I argue that we need to ground the understanding of the macro processes in the periphery in the exploration of concrete circumstances in which the specific historical conjuncture is crystallized in a specific context, that is, to use ethnography. That is why I will focus on the concrete circumstances of the workers employed in the three companies rather than try to generalize about the class struggle and historical bloc in Serbia today. But I will go back to the macroscape in the conclusion to draw out some insights for potential political work. Okay, so let me go on with the <coughs> examples. The first example is uh, of the process that I call disciplining, and it takes place in Fiat Automobile Serbia, uh, which used to be the Zastava car manufacturer. And uh, it can show uh, the global mobility of capital and all those broad processes that are underway, which enable Fiat on the one hand their powerful position at home uh, because they can threaten their workers to move production from Italy to other countries, which is in turn uh, enabled by uh, exploitation of workers uh, in the periphery and subsidies that they continue to receive uh, from the states that want to uh, attract foreign direct investment. And uh, the official uh, state policies um, are completely uh, in line with, with these processes. And Fiat is really highly regarded by the politicians. They always emphasize how it's a big exporter, although they never say how much it imports in order to produce cars in Serbia. And uh, what is often forgotten is that uh, Zastava as a system uh, used to employ um, around 30,000 workers before the 90s, uh, and Fiat today employs uh, with all the companies uh, that work for it, around 15% of, of that number. Um, so what happens in the company uh, is uh, a form of crisis. Uh, there was only one outbreak of dissatisfaction when um, a group of workers or a worker sabotaged the production by scratching the, the paint of the new cars and we could see the immediate reaction of the police, of the public attorney, uh, and uh, some high officials who uh, claimed that they were ashamed of the act. Uh, so we see also that uh, the company itself uh, does a lot of ideological work to cover the exploitation of workers. So they build a nice pond in the factory circle. Uh, they call the factory our factory. Uh, they organize family days so that family members of workers can come. and. Uh, and uh, see the workplace, and even the recent baby boom is uh, in Kragovac is uh, ascribed to the benevolent fiat. Uh, and all of these activities and strategies of the company are used to, and I quote, motivate and spark productivity of the employees and contribute to the development of team spirit and positive atmosphere among the employees and team leaders. So the classic neoliberal spiel. Um, and at the same time creating the internal market where, where workers compete among themselves. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have the great reserve army of labor of some 22,000 unemployed in Kragovac, 
who are constantly pressing and uh, pursuing jobs. Uh, some 1,000 workers, unemployed workers, are actively pursuing work in Fiat, always trying to, uh, to get into Fiat. And uh, in the low paid positions, we can see that workers get changed really often. So it's a, it's a real threat. Also, there are more than 1,600 workers uh, who left the firm before uh, Fiat was taken, before Fiat took over Zastava. Um, and they were promised a special monthly payment um, by the state until they could retire or find new jobs. But uh, the payments were irregular and they could never find new jobs um, because Fiat's partners were employing new and young workers. Uh, but they were also obliged to undergo training that would qualify them for new workplaces, so the classical individualist story of um, our qualities in the workplace, blah, blah, blah. Um, so these workers are organized, or ex-workers, are organized and fight for a labor union, but without much success. Um, and uh, there are also reductions in the number of workers uh, in other companies that were created when Zastava was broken up. Uh, and there are around <coughs> 1,800 workers who were asked to take the social program and leave the companies voluntarily before they are sold and closed. Okay. The second example of what I call dispossession is the case of Yastrebets, uh, which is a really good example of many uh, unsuccessful privatizations in, um, in Serbia. Um, before the privatization, it was successful in exporting its product, but um, now it, I mean, it, the, the production is really reduced. Um, and we can see uh, how the role of the state uh, in the fate of Yastrebets concretely, but in other, many other cases, was usually contradictory. First, uh, they insisted on privatizations, which were supposed to alleviate the, the debts um, towards workers and, and others. Uh, Yes, first privatized in an auction uh, and bought by a consortium of two companies. Uh, at that point, they were owed, the workers were owed 12 salaries. Um, and after three months, they started general strike because uh, the production was not restarted and their salaries were not paid. And there were speculations that uh, the consortium only bought it so they could use the land to build a uh, parking lot for the supermarket that they built nearby. Um, the privatization was annulled, and then the company was sold on the stock market to a Russian company uh, for the amount that was 30 times less than the estimated book value. Uh, this new uh, owner managed to uh, increase the debt to 45 salaries, so the workers were paid nothing for almost additional three years. And the company then went bankrupt and started the administration procedure called Stecha in Serbia. And uh, the assembly of claimants decided that they want to go into restructuring. Um, they created two daughter companies. They managed to transfer all the, the company's facilities, machines, tools, and funds without the debts, including the debts to workers. They uh, only employed around uh, two fifths of the workers in those two daughter companies. And they never, even those who were employed, never received what was owed to them. And there were even, even allegations that the administrator of the company allowed the subsidiary companies to illegally employ workers while forbidding the ex-workers to come to the factory grounds. Um, and although the production in these new companies were, was profitable, uh, the workers' demands were not met, um, even after one minister pitched deals uh, to the company. Uh, so the autonomous trade union uh, which gathered uh, many of the workers from the company, they sued the company, and as an outcome they became the owners of the main production facility. Uh, so the Court of Appeals approved that decision, made it legally valid, and the subsidiaries were forbidden to dispose of the property, but in the end, tax administration blocked the company account and choked the production. So you see that many different institutions within the state were doing things that were completely contradictory. And finally, the third example of what I call disorganization in Serbian railways. And uh, as in the case with many other uh, railway companies, um, it is not a profit-making enter enterprise. Uh, and it survives because of the government subsidies. Uh, and they always claim that the subsidies are 
too big and they need to be reduced, cut back. Um, and one of the pressures uh, that has been uh, showing up in the, in the last couple of years or a couple of months, actually, uh, is the liberalization of the railway network. Um, so in cargo transportation, there is a huge risk that uh, the competing companies uh, will take all the better deals because they have the competitive advantage of better locomotives, better wagons, higher priority. So the cargo transportation, which is the only one uh, profitable now, um, will, uh, will suffer because of that. Um, and the subsidies that are already presented as uh, too big, if they are uh, reduced or uh, completely taken away, um, there is a possibility to shut down cargo transportation. On the other hand, for the passenger transportation, the, the situation is even gloomier. Um, the history of socialist modernity brought railways as a means of che uh, cheap transportation meant to increase mobility both in its physical and social aspect. And I think it is really important because if left to the market uh, conditions, uh, the prices in passenger transportation might uh, skyrocket and many uh, unprofitable uh, lines might be closed <coughs> so that some people um, can be reduced to complete immobility or forced to permanently move to places where they can access goods and services without the need for transportation. Um, and this liberalization goes hand in hand with restructuring of the companies that uh, the Serbian Railways has been undergoing for the past, I don't know, 10 years or so. Um, the most important aspects are downsizing, so layoffs of around 14,000 workers, uh, shutting down parts of the railway network that have the biggest losses, um, or that were in the worst condition, and splitting the company into three companies. Uh, so this last uh, thing that I mentioned, splitting the company, uh, almost uh, tripled, or at least tripled, the number of people employed in the administration, whereas at the same time, the blue-collar workers were hardest hit, uh, since their salaries uh, haven't been raised in years, and the number of workers was almost um, reduced by half. Uh, unfortunately, uh, so far there were no layoffs, uh, rather workers voluntarily retired with severance pay, but they keep uh, emphasizing that there is a possibility of workers being, uh, being sacked if they don't want to leave the company on their own. Uh, and in this example we can see how the public interest in having affordable transportation and the particular interest of railway workers in saving their jobs are crystallized in, the, in this transition case. Um, so what was the response of labor unions? Um, one major strike took place in 1993 when the first independent labor union was formed. And since then, 20, over 20 labor unions uh, have been founded in this company and some were founded by the management to split the workers. Um, and the labor union officials are guaranteed paid positions and benefits, um, and especially for loyal union leaders, which pits workers against each other. So they do not act in concert, and even 10% uh, of the workers do not belong to any unions. Um, the last big strike took place in 2002, so in the beginning of these measures, they were supposed to restructure the company, uh, and it had really little success. Uh, so that labor unions' activities since then have been limited to participation in the social dialogue and sporadic calls for the management change. And the last call for protest uh, resulted in a huge pressure by the management on workers to leave labor unions or else be sacked. Okay, so let me conclude now. The conclusion is somewhat long. I'm sorry about that. So these two examples only scratch the surface of the variety of circumstances in which workers in Serbia find themselves today. The government policies directly shape the processes that take place on the macro level in Serbia. The capital flow from the core countries, the state involvement through subsidies for privately owned companies, reduction of subsidies for the publicly owned ones, preference for private and corporate ownership, and so on. The outcome of such policies is the obvious lack of solidarity between private and public sector workers, but also among workers in specific fields and even workers in specific companies. However, to understand how this came to be, we must not stop at the government policies level, but try to understand the meso-level processes that I call disciplining, dispossession and disorganization. In other words, macro outcomes come to be uh, through scaling up of these instances within the conjuncture. 
the state can only set the stage. But there is a myriad of places where the reproduction of capital-labor relations may be brought into question. In order to understand why this reproduction goes unchallenged in most cases, I argue that we need to pay more attention to this meso level in our analysis. This will help us rethink the organizational potential of the workers since these processes define the workers' concrete material circumstances, but also to notice and use the cleavages in the workings of different state institutions that can be deeply contradictory, as I mentioned in the case of yesterday. So, for example, while the privatization agency may pursue privatization as a rule of thumb, there may be strategies that allow the workers to hold elected officials accountable in cases when they take up populist rhetorics. There are also institutions such as the ombudsman, courts and anti-corruption agencies whose relative independence from the executive branch may challenge the dominant force on the human rights grounds or even purely procedural and legalistic grounds. And we have seen in many cases that workers can use those, um, those institutions, for example. Yugoslavia Media may be the best example. Rather than generalizing about the state of the struggle in the country as such, I describe these three examples to ground the generalization about disciplining dispossession and disorganization as meso-level processes. Disciplining methods usually described as part of neoliberal governmentality in the workplace result in quiescence of workers, especially when the reserve labor force is numerous and eager to take up any jobs. The disciplined in this case truly know that what is worse for workers than being exploited in capitalism is not being exploited at all. Otherwise, the fate of the dispossessed lurks behind the corner. Dispossession has created armies of people that have nothing to leave, lose in the struggle, but often lack the organizational and material prerequisites for such struggle. Even in rare cases, when they do manage to organize, most often it is short-lasting and limited to the partial struggle. Groups of workers easily fall out of the organized front as soon as their partial demands are met. This results in disorganizations, disorganization of the workers as such, partly helped by the institutional framework that allows labor union officials to separate from rank and file members and be co-opted by management structures. In such a way, particularization of the struggle easily creates the weakest links that compromise the nationwide or the region-wide struggle. So what is to be done or what can be done? Because I'm not a decent Leninist to ask the really brutal question. I argue that a significant part of our analysis and future political work will need to include addressing the organizational structure, material dependence, and perception of labor unions. Competition between unions arises from their dependence on the ownership and management structures since they provide funds and positions for union leaders. Of course, in the private sectors, unions are virtually non-existent and sometimes need to be built from scratch. For that to happen, the public perception of unions as interest groups for corrupt union leaders and not all workers is what needs to be addressed and changed. This will require ideological work, which is wider than the focus on unions th themselves, since they are embedded in wider narratives and understandings of what socialism and capitalism are. We must not forget that our analysis of political economy very often do not resonate with people who are hard hit by the very processes we analyze. The problem arises partly from the lack of connections between the academic lab and workers engaged in the struggle. But part of the problem lies in the focus on the deliberative and argumentative aspect of our analysis. I argue that overcoming this problem will require supplementing our analysis with meaningful engagement with effective registers that allow mobilization. Nationalism proves to be less and less attractive, and it is currently limited to explaining away the material circumstances through the idiom of our people's mentality, rendering passive those who utter such explanations. However, there are alternative effective registers that may serve the purpose for mobilization, and the Yugoslav Golden Age, I argue, may be one of them. We must understand why the idea of the socialist self-management Yugoslav period never acquired the mobilizing potential in the post-socialist period. Although it almost always has a positive connotation in terms of relative material well-being. I think it is time for the left in Serbia and beyond to find a way to tap into this nostalgia and make it productive. Thank you.
much for this interesting presentation. And next up is Ane Korsika with his take on the specific situation in Slovenia. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Uh, <laughs> always. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Well, Anita said that I will be talking extensively on the uh, situation, on the case of Slovenia, which is not entirely true. I will be rather focusing on the problem of uh, class consciousness. And I have a good excuse for that, because tomorrow, Comrade Branko Bempic, who I personally, and I'm the only one, believe is the, the best expert on the Marxist class analysis in Slovenia, it will be a keynote lecture. So why recycle something that you can get from the source itself? Uh, okay, the title of this uh, speech is No to the Class Situation in Slovenia, from Class Compromise to Class Struggle, but as I already said, the talk will be a bit different. The conventional story of Slovenia being the success story of countries of former Eastern Bloc, the Balkan, Switzerland, and the lighthouse of Europe, as some of our most delusional politicians have called it, has now finally shattered to pieces. No one with any sanity left can argue for any kind of such exclusivism. On the contrary, the country is now deeply rooted in a chain of European peripheral countries. Michael Roberts, who recently participated on our symposium devoted to the socialization of the banking sector, noted that in the period of 2008-2013, Greece's real gross domestic product fell by 23%. But the next biggest fall was Slovenia at 10%. He also underlined that the estimates for this year show Slovenia will be the only one of peripheral countries still falling. Having said that, it seems that we have better chances of becoming the worst rather than the best, as earlier mentioned politicians have fantasized about. The fact is hardships people are enduring are real and getting worse by each passing month. 400,000 people are living below the poverty line or at risk of falling below it, with more than 130,000 people unemployed and 14.2% unemployment rate, and with forecasts of the third quarter of this year reaching 14.5% in unemployment. The unemployment as such is quickly approaching the record level of 15.5%, which we had in early 90s. At this point, it is also worth noting uh, that before the disintegration of Yugoslavia, uh, in the Socialist Republic of Slovenia, unemployment was practically non-existent, and actually one of the lowest in the world. There are, there are other alarming um, uh, signs of social disintegration and uh, hardship. For example, there are alarming numbers of elementary and high school students which cannot afford a school meal anymore. Instead of systematically addressing these issues by social policies, we are witnessing programs like the one on the national radio called the Become a Godfather. Where you can become an anonymous godfather to a child and donate some money each month. This program reports on horrific stories of children whose parents almost uh, uh, whose parents cannot afford to pay for their school meals or even provide them with a meal at home. They depict techniques how to combat hunger. For example, one child explained that he tries to drink as much water as possible to ease down the feeling of hunger. These are stories of social mimicry, as poverty is still perceived as something shameful and a clear sign of one's incompetence. So beside everything else, these students must hide their poverty. What is even more telling is that in many cases, their parents are not unemployed people, just people that cannot get through the month with the wage they earn. And just recently we had reports on the fact that around 20% of the university student population helps their parents with paying the bills, groceries, etc. Especially among youth, the precarious jobs are practically the only ones available and even they are increasingly lacking. There are thousands of former workers who had secure jobs who had secured job contracts for the indefinite period of time, but were forced by their employer to open their own companies and become the so-called small entrepreneurs. In such a way, company was able to avoid paying any social health or pension contributions, and all of these costs fell on the shoulders of their former employee, their new contractual business partner. 
Such cases are far more limited to private sector and were endemic at our national broadcaster, Radio Televisia Slovenia. We could continue counting the underminings of people's material status and social security. However, we just wanted to illustrate that the suffering and the exploitation of people is real and is getting worse and worse. Having said that, it shouldn't have been such a surprise that from autumn 2012 to the spring of 2013, massive protests, practically unseen since the collapse of Yugoslavia, have erupted. At the highest point, more than 30,000 people have taken to the streets and protested the austerity measures, public sector cuts, etc. Trade unions have actually managed to gather higher amounts of people, but those protests were more specific and have focused on specific policies that were trying to be implemented at the time, for example, flat tax in 2005. However, recent protests were more general and are especially interesting because for the first time both right-wing as well as left-wing politicians were the target of critique. Although the predominant slogan of the protests was they are all the same and could, could be interpreted on the most elementary level of tot as, a tot as a total distrust of politics and politicians as such, one would also see a deeper meaning in this slogan. Yes, they are all the same. Whether social democrats or conservatives are in power, they have their minor unimportant differences, but when it comes to serving the interests of capital, they are actually all the same. One would see in this an embryo of a different kind of politics. Yes, small and fragile, poorly articulated and heavily invested with moralism, but nonetheless, Socialism never drops from the sky and is always a result of long-term struggles. We can argue that these protests were a crucial point in the progress of socialist political thought and the socialist ideology as such. It was for the first time, after more than 20 years, that socialism as a political signifier enjoyed a comeback in media and public discourse. In Initiative for Democratic Socialism, we used each and every opportunity to publicly present our ideas, argue that they are the only rational answer to the ongoing crisis and that the nature of capitalist crisis is inherently systemic and not, and not just some sort of unpleasant anomaly neoliberals would have us believe. Despite, despite such changes being primarily of discursive nature, they are still important. However, it did not took long, took long for other newly or recently established parties to start flirting with the idea of democratic socialism. Not a bene, when there was a, a public survey about uh, people's attitude towards capitalism and socialism, 16% of, of questions replied that they are more fond of capitalism, while 46% responded that they prefer socialism. So overnight we had an inflation of semi-socialist rhetoric and quasi-socialist parties. Without the unnecessary self-modesty, it is safe to say that the great majority of these ad hoc socialists were in, for, were in for a more opportunity reasons or didn't really have a good understanding of basics of socialist policies, namely class struggle. For them, the main motto, I would argue, became people of goodwill of all lands unite. Although they tried to present themselves as a kind of leftist alternative, the most obvious examples of such strategy are party solidarity and the election list of Igor Scholtes, former president of Court of Auditors. They were never willing to clearly position themselves. They wanted everything. Economic growth, secure jobs, competitive companies, strong public sector, and so on and so on. Being devoid of any socialist substance, ignoring the actually existing class nature of, cap of capitalist society, they were in effect dancing to the rhymes of capital. This political phenomenon is already perfectly described in Marx's Poverty of Philosophy when he talks about the philanthropic school of economists. I quote, it denies the necessity of antagonism. It wants to turn all men into bourgeois. In theory, it is easy to make an abstraction of the contradictions that are met with at every moment in actual reality. They want to retain the categories which express bourgeois relations without the antagonism which constitutes them and is inseparable from them. They think they are seriously fighting bourgeois practice, but they are more bourgeois than the others. It is exactly such kind of appeals to trans-class solidarity from the party solidarity that have been their main strategy. 
time and, the, time and again have they publicly stressed they, they want the left to unite in one big party and, it is, and that this is the only way to achieve any substantial political power. Any refutal of such invitations was met with moral outrage and indignation. How could, how could one possibly decline to be in a coalition of good willing men of all ages, colors, world views and class positions if we are united in, a common, in our common goal to improve the living conditions of the members of our society? Well, the fact that party solidarity and other similar parties had among its ranks all kinds of liberal politicians from various other parties that were already in power and have already successfully improved the living conditions of members of our society, well, at least the owners of capital were better off, is not crucial here. What is crucial is to demystify, expose and debunk such political strategy as one that has nothing remotely to do with socialism. In trying to transcend the actually existing divisions in the capitalist society, that is, the class division and the necessity of class struggle, such position is not just obscuring these facts, but actually reaffirming them on behalf of capital, whether they do it consciously or not. It is a false and hypocritical neutralization of a social space that can never be neutral. Even worse, one trying to be neutral is in effect always supporting the status quo. That is the actually existing structure of relations of power. At the end of the day, it is he or she is supporting the continuation of the, the dictatorship of capital. Such neutrality is as virtuous as was the neutrality of Switzerland, Sweden or Spain during the Second World War. The first one provided third right with safe haven for its capital. The second supplied Nazis with the production of ball bearings necessary to build tanks. And the last one, which was a fascist regime itself, provided military support to Eastern Front, where more than 45,000 Spanish soldiers have fought. This false neutrality and quasi-transcendence of actually existing social divisions was very much present in the predecessors of above-mentioned fascists, the white movement, a coalition of anti-communist forces that fought Bolsheviks in the Russian Civil War of 1917 to 1922. Let us just quote one of their former generals, Anton Denikin. He argued, for a united, great and indivisible Russia, which all nationalities and clans live in harmony. It matters not whether you stand on the left or the right. Love our tormented motherland and help us save her. In effect, he therefore called upon all men and women who loved freedom and justice to set aside their political and social differences and to de dedicate themselves to fight to the death against uh, Bolsheviks. What the Nikin obviously forgot was that this was precisely the war of political and social differences and that themselves were to determine what kind of freedom and justice one could enjoy after the war. Bolsheviks have never forgotten that and have eventually, against all odds, managed to defeat all of 16 foreign armies fighting on behalf of the whites and all of the 14 governments the whites have established across the Russian territory. Without any substantial effort, one could continue naming examples of what really is at the core of such appeals to trans-class solidarity. If we emphasize once again, such strategy <coughs> of intentionally or unintentionally ignoring the class division of the capitalist society will always lead to its reinforcement on behalf of capital. History teaches us that when push comes to show, such quasi-political alternatives unmask themselves for what they really are, fascists. <laughs> on the other hand, socialist policy, based on Marxist analysis of the inherent contradictions of capitalist system of production, on the contrary, emphasizes class antagonisms, as it is well aware that they can be transcended only materially, that is, they must be abolished in the sense of coercive and dominant social relations. On such level of abstraction, it is not difficult to show where is the core of the problem. A true challenge is to introduce such awareness amongst the widest working masses. <laughs> However, I believe that if we take class struggle seriously, if we see it as a kind of social warfare, a permanent civil war of bourgeois society that is going on, although the ruling class does everything in its power to portray this as a natural, as a natural state of affairs, well then, I believe as socialists, we as socialists should also arm ourselves for this struggle. 
I am most sympathetic to the idea of first Prime Minister of Socialist Republic of Slovenia, Boris Kibric, who during the fascist occupation and national liberation struggle developed the idea of building a state within a state. It goes without saying that one cannot freely copy-paste historical practices on the present situation. However, critically engaging with them is one of the most productive things we can do. It shows us that dilemmas we are experiencing nowadays have been experienced, intensely discussed and solved in various ways by our political predecessors. If politics in capitalist society are necessarily and by definition class politics, and if it is obvious that the ideology of hegemony bourgeoisie enjoys is materially rooted, we as socialists can only rely on people's masses on building all kinds of new institutions, ranging from cultural, media and political organizations to sport society, working brigades and various other kinds of practices through which we can socialize ourselves to becoming socialists. I still believe the most succinct guide to what is to be done is the slogan of Wilhelm Leibniz, Leibniz the father of perhaps better known Karl Lindner. Abitieren, organisieren, studieren. <laughs> Only through such persistent, continuous and devoted work we will achieve a widespread awareness of the existence of class struggle. Before finishing, let me allow to quote, quote a longer passage from 10 Days That Shook the World, a fantastic first-hand report on October Revolution written by American Marxist journalist John Reed. We sallied out into the town. Just at the door of the station stood two soldiers with rifles and bayonets fixed. They were surrounded by about a hundred businessmen, government officials and students, who attacked them with passionate argument and epithet. The soldiers were uncomfortable and hurt, like children unjustly scolded. A tall young man with a superlicious expression, dressed in the uniform of a student, was leading the attack. You realize, I presume, he said insolently, that by taking up arms against your brothers, you are making yourselves the tools of murderers and traitors. No, brother, answered the soldier earnestly. You don't understand. There are two classes. Don't you see? The proletariat and the bourgeoisie. We all know of I know that silly talk, wrote the student rudely. A bunch of ignorant peasants like you hear somebody bawling a few catchwords. You don't understand what they mean. You just echo them like a lot of parents. The crowd left. I'm a Marxian student, and I tell you, this isn't socialism you're fighting for. This is just plain pro-German anarchy. Oh, yes, I know, answered the soldier, with sweat dripping from his brow. You're an educated man, that is easy to see. And I'm only a simple man, but it seems to me, I suppose, interrupted the other contemptuously, that you believe Lenin is a real friend of the proletariat. Yes, I do, answered the soldier, suffering. Well, my friend, do you know that Lenin was sent through Germany in a closed car? Do you know that Lenin took money from the Germans? Well, I don't know much about that, answered the soldier, stop around. But it seems to me that what he says is what I want to hear, and all the simple men like me. Now, there are two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. You're a fool! Why, my friend, I spent two years in Schlussberg for revolutionary activity, when you were still shooting down revolutionists and singing God Save the Tsar? My name is Vasily Grigorievich Pani. Didn't you ever hear of me? I'm sorry to say I never did, answered the soldier with humility. But then, I'm not an educated man. You probably are a great hero. I am, said the student with conviction. And I'm opposed to the Bolsheviki, who are destroying our Russia, our free revolution. Now, how do you account for that? The soldier stretched his hand, his head. I cannot account for it all, he said grimacing with the pain of his intellectual processes. To me it seems perfectly simple, but then I'm not well educated. It seems to me like there are only two classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. There you go, there you go again with your silly formula, cried the student. Only two classes went on the soldier doggedly, and whoever isn't on one side is on the other. Uh, on the specific situation and the analysis of 
uh, transition uh, to from uh, socialist to capitalist Slovenia. Uh, and now our last speaker is Marko Kostanić. And um, don't hesitate, the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> uh, my, my presentation is much more pessimistic than honest, but I think we could provide a very uh, productive uh, combination because I want to talk about some institutional, political, and especially economic constraints in terms of building the left, especially in Croatia, but in peripheral countries. In, in, in terms of providing a coherent program with, with some kind of feasible program which somehow is in accordance with the interests of the, of the popular uh, uh, crisis. So, so I want to show how the, the narrow, how the space for the political um, the political engagement is narrow in the peripheral uh, countries and I want to uh, speak from the, uh, let's say, uh, very conditionally from the Gramsci and Polanco's uh, perspective so I'm just now into it, reading those uh, stuff, and I'm not uh, really confident how to use it on the on the peripheral uh, states. So this this would be some kind of hints. So please, after after the presentation, uh, criticize it and give me some uh, instructions how to do uh, how to do that better. So the the first question, some kind of overall overall question, I want to ask: How does uh, the state function in the periphery. What's the role of the peripheral uh, peripheral uh, state in terms uh, of in terms of the uh, Engels' famous uh, definition of the state as an ideal collective capital? Uh, so just not to, uh, to to give a brief definition. I was too lazy to type this. In the so I, I took the book. Uh, the brief definition, just to give you uh, give you a sense, what does it mean? The ideal collective uh, capital is the some kind of uh, short outline of the definition by, uh, by German uh, Marcus Ingo uh, Spitzel so about this uh, notion that Engels, um, uh, Engels conceptualized. So Spitzel says that the capital state does not constitute an, an, an omniscient meta subject. Nevertheless, it articulates the general interests of capital as opposed to the particular interests, interests of competing individual capitals. According to Friedrich Engels, it represents the ideal collective capital. He postulated that the total capital interest is both a necessary condition of existence of the capital mode of production and a result of state policies. The state neither possesses direct knowledge of total capital interest, nor does it represent the arithmetic mean of all particular societal interests and relations with forces. Rather, its constitution requires it to produce knowledge that brings government in line with the total capital interest. So, uh, the problem with the peripheral states especially in terms of its integration in the uh, uh, EU, is that what kind of knowledge is produced from, uh, from the perspective of, of the peripheral state? Is, does it just reproduce the, the knowledge that comes in, in, uh, in the form of directives uh, from the Bristol? And how these different contradictory, uh, contradictory positions are articulated in terms of, of, the, of the power block of different uh, fractions of uh, capital and who is, which uh, fraction is hegemonic? And also in which uh, way, through the material infrastructure, the material provisions, and the ideology, are the popular classes subordinated? That, that is integrated in a uh, in a system. Well, in which way does the hegemony uh, hegemony uh, functions? The first thing I think we, we should uh, mention that there is uh, it's called some kind of division of labor in terms of uh, of. Uh, uh, politics and the instruments that, that were uh, in before, before were just state instruments. Now we have this kind of division of labor between the EU institutions and, and the nation, uh, nation states. Uh, just uh, simply in, in the EU with the master state we, we have, we have the, the common monetary policy, uh, the liberalization of, of, uh, of trade and of course and the fiscal policies which are not uh, the EU is, there is no coordination of fiscal policy, but the master criteria you all know 3%, 60% of that arbitrary stuff. So that this is some kind of constraint how to for, for the for the nation state. On the other side, the nation states are still dealing with the, the, the labor market in the EU is still segmented, still dealing with the labor market and also with the social uh, social provisions, collecting taxes and and that stuff. So there's some kind of first uh, contradiction in uh, in, in terms of, of identifying and trying to articulate what is the function, what is the role of 
the state in the periphery in terms of, the, of ideal collective capital, capitalists whose function is uh, just uh, to, to, to say again, to articulate and organize different short-term and long-term interests of different fractions of capital class, but also to, to manage to, to, to reproduce the capitalist social formation as a whole. I think that there is one uh, in terms of different uh, fractions. I will give a little bit, a bit later this kind of just a little bit of the historical trajectory of Croatian economy and, and the way how the ruling classes were, uh, uh, were divided. Uh, of course, the hegemony is in, uh, is in Croatia, but also in some different um, in, in, lot, in lots of Eastern European uh, countries that the uh, financial capital and comparative bourgeoisie in a sense mostly located in financial capital, uh, telecommunications and this kind of uh, profitable uh, the most profitable sectors of economy and also the import uh, uh, the, the, the importers of the uh, foreign goods are the, of course the, the hegemonic fraction in uh, in, uh, in, in the ruling class and we can see that, that the state uh, this, which is, it is, it is, uh, uh, policies is, is in agreement in a sense that this is coordinated in a sense that the hegemonic force in this state as ideal collective capitalist is, in, is on the side of uh, this part of the ruling class. You can see that, that most, the most uh, vividly in terms of uh, monetary policy, with the appreciation of the, uh, of the currency, uh, currency in all these uh, uh, international agreements and integrations integrations and the uh, WTO stuff and all that that was in, in favor of, of this kind of capital. The other side, the national, the so-called national uh, bourgeoisie doesn't have any kind of um, uh, political uh, power in, in a sense that was most visible uh, during, the, during the referendum for the EU accession. Before the, the referendum, uh, in, in the, uh, they speak about the national bourgeoisie that was mostly located in a that, that is what, especially before the crisis in the construction industry and also this kind of food in the industry uh, especially and also maybe in, in private, uh, private uh, capital. But uh, the, this uh, interesting, interesting uh, point I want to make that before the uh, EU accession and the debates around the referendum there was no voice from, from this uh, from this fraction of uh, capital and it was a little bit uh, uh, interesting. It was funny because you know after we entered the, the EU, we are leaving uh, the CEFTA, and Croatia had uh, positive trade balances in, in uh, CEFTA, especially these firms who were, uh, were exporting uh, their products to uh, Bosnia and Serbia. Uh, especially, and there was there, there had no kind of political uh, political power to introduce their interests in uh, public space just after the, the referendum was finished, they, they said, okay, this is not really good for us, we don't know what to do now, maybe we will uh, uh, move our production sites to, to Bosnia and uh, Serbia, that was the only, uh, the only rational thing uh, to, do, uh, to do for them. But, okay, this is some kind of brief outline of how this economic power is translated into political power in terms, of, in terms of the fractions of the ruling class, but it's interesting how how uh, material provisions and ideological uh, framework were utilized uh, from the political elites and from the ruling class to integrate, uh, to integrate uh, the, the popular classes. There were some really contradictions and some kind of uh, coincidence in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, maybe you can see this coincidence, okay, we said that the, the, the comparator project in the financial capital is the hegemonic, uh, hegemonic fraction and uh, uh, their, uh, their position uh, was also reproduced to the, uh, uh, in this aspect of integration of the uh, popper uh, crisis during the, from 2003-2008 with, <coughs> with, 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 with the credit info, especially uh, uh, for the households in terms of, of for credit uh, for, for buying uh, different uh, goods and especially for uh, mortgages. And this kind of uh, that credit info gave this kind of illusion that we are really on the our way, uh, our way to the European uh, uh, paradise, and it was really somehow uh, the way also uh, also the, the, in this uh, period to 2003 to 2008 that, that this kind of credit info I think was the crucial um, uh, 
material pro provision for that kind of uh, ideological, ideological uh, uh, framework. As, as Omaga said earlier, uh, the EU will serve as some kind, kind of uh, uh, teleological goal from the perspective of the Croatian um, uh, independence, both for the nationalists and, and, for, the, uh, and uh, for the liberals. On the other hand, uh, the crisis now is, is already for six, uh, six years uh, with us. Uh, the other way how to, how to organize, uh, how to integrate the, the uh, popular classes in, in, in a block is, was, to the, uh, was to the budget, the true state, uh, state budget. And there was, you know, on the other hand, you, you, keep, you still have the, the hegemony of, of the, of the uh, financial fraction of the ruling class, but on the other hand, the, the material uh, uh, when the credit inflows stop, the only material way to to, uh, to support the, the, the stability uh, of the system is predominantly organized to do uh, through the budget. Because this is a, this is a story uh, from the beginning of the creation. Uh, uh, independence, this, that was the way how the, the, the parties uh, uh, were functioning through the straight budget because of, of the it's only in this period between 2003 to 2008 you can see this, this uh, different way of material provisions that were uh, stabilizing uh, the ideological uh, situation. But you know there was lots of examples how the, uh, in 90s and 2000s the, through through the budget uh, provisions uh, the state was somehow uh, trying to manage all these detrimental consequences of the process of privatization and and uh, uh, deindustrialization. Okay, after the war, you have this big, uh, uh, in, in the end of the 90s, uh, the lots of uh, war veterans were, were retired because uh, due, due to the deindustrialization, privatization processes, uh, the labor market in the peripheral states like uh, Croatia couldn't absorb uh, all, the, all the workforce, so the state had to intervene uh, with the retirements and on the one hand, on the other hand, with the uh, through, through the uh, mechanisms of the ruling uh, parties uh, to employ people in the public sector and state state owned firms and those people employed there uh, also uh, function as some kind of uh, as, a, as, as a voting uh, machine. So in a sense, okay, this is kind of my uh, hypothesis concerning the, the role of the uh, a Croatian state that we can see uh, that the state was some kind of mechanism to to avoid the most uh, uh, the most uh, the hard uh, consequences of the, of the economic uh, of the economic crisis. But we can see that somehow, in a sense, that, that there was some kind of conflation of the uh, role of the welfare state and the state as some kind of managerial uh, role. How does this welfare provisions are are, put, are given to, to the the popular class is not through the system of, of the, the usual system of the welfare state, but through the mechanism, uh, mechanisms of retirement or the mechanisms of, of uh, corruption. Uh, in the sense that in the situation when, where the political parties are, when are there in power, they have, no, um, they have no space for any kind of political decisions to be, uh, to be made, especially in the economic sense. There is no fiscal sovereignty, no monetary sovereignty. Uh, Anything they only can, uh, can uh, uh, try try to lower the, the labor cost and, all, uh, and and play with the different uh, tax system to to attract uh, investments. But there is no anyway how these uh, parties when they are in power, they're, they're, when they are in co control uh, of the state, they, uh, how they can provide any kind of welfare to citizen. Uh, they have not any kind of uh, fiscal capacity for that. The only way to do that, I think, uh, it's, it's, it's through corruption. I think that corruption is the structural effect of, of the uh, way how the peripheral uh, state function. Of course, not, not some kind of uh, mentality of of uh, the Eastern Balkan uh, people. That was the only way how to secure some kind of material provision that would function uh, as as um, uh, as. Um, uh, material, uh, material, uh, oh shit, 
You can't do it, are, are you missing your work of the relation between material infrastructure and ideology? And so I think that the corruption was the only uh, uh, was the only way uh, left. And now also it's interesting that corruption, now especially in Serbia, but Croatia at last five years uh, was the crucial political word in political uh, space. It, it was also the uh, the only it was the only this was the only political space due to that narrowness that I mentioned because of the economic, institutional, and political uh, uh, political uh, uh, path of uh, Croatia in the last. Uh, 20 years ago, that was the only space when you can have some kind of, of political debate and the only space where you can engage with some real political uh, political uh, instruments and also, unfortunately, unfortunately, it started to function as a, as a way to explain the social and uh, political, uh, political processes. So, I don't have much time, but I will just uh, want to uh, a little bit and, and try to ask what is the position of the left in this kind of uh, constellation because it, it really, it really it, in Croatia, as you, uh, I think over, uh, all of you know, there is not any kind of established uh, socially visible and, politi and uh, political uh, strength and any kind of uh, uh, left that can function as a relevant uh, political uh, actor, but in these terms of situation that I have outlined in terms of these limitations for uh, political action, we need to ask, okay, is there any kind of space to intervene from the, from the left uh, uh, from the left position? I, and I think that may, maybe this is a crude analogy, but I think the left in terms of it's called political organization or the party should in a sense function in an analogy with this uh, Engels, Engels notion of ideal political capitalist, some kind of ideal collective uh, collective labor. That, because all, first thing we have to acknowledge is that uh, the interests of the popular classes in, in a short term period, especially in a situation like this, with the way of the dependence on the budget and, and the, the, the way how the, uh, the sector, different sector employments and all, all that stuff, that the common interests, uh, there are no, the interests of the popular classes in the short term, with, with short term measurements, are not homogeneous. Mm -hmm. They are very really different and there are uh, lots of cases in contradiction. You have the privilege to claim that, these, uh, that their immediate interest is common only when they when are when really not activated in a real politics. Of course, is, you can say that in long term interest, they have a common interest of the abolishment of the, of the capitalist system, but in a way, when we want to intervene in the political space with some concrete measures, we, we, will, be, we, we will not be able to avoid uh, contradiction. Contradiction. To have one uh, example, if you want, I don't know, to the valued currency because it, it's now uh, harmful for, for the for the exports. You have the problem on the one side that the people who took this that I was mentioning mortgages uh, for to buy their uh, to buy their apartments, it will be a, bit, a real problem with the devaluation of currency because their credits are linked uh, to euro and they have to pay them in euro and they are earning their the wages in, in Kunas. On the other hand, that will be good, that will be good for some exporters or some peasants or, some, or something like this. So you have the, the immediate uh, conflict uh, of interest and in what way you can solve that from the from the left uh, uh, position. There is no there is no uh, clear uh, clear. Way. Also, I think the, uh, that that's the problem we have to really take uh, to really think about when I'm thinking about a left uh, uh, position, not to think it's some. A historical sense, okay, we are socialists and something will just come up because we know how the things, uh, how the things work. We have to function as this kind of knowledge apparatus as a state is in a sense and try to articulate this different kind of uh, different interests in, uh, I repeat, in, in the short term and, and also somehow to, to, to respond to this interest to, to the concrete uh, measures. Also the second, I think, uh, problem in, in peripheral uh, uh, countries, which is different than, uh, let's say, in, uh, in the core countries uh, for the left, because in the core countries, the state, if it, if it, in terms of these reformist measures, still have this, this political and economic strength to do, uh, to do something in independent economies like Croatia, the state doesn't have any kind of, or still doesn't have any kind of power for any kind of you know, development 
developmental model uh, that will be different than this one. But just to say that also in terms when we are now uh, participating in different fights uh, for the welfare state defense, the defense of the welfare state or defense of the uh, of the workers in some uh, factories that is fighting against these uh, uh, processes of politics of lowering wages to attract uh, investors. I think, uh, of course, we have to fight against it uh, with no with no uh, conditions. But I think the crucial thing, that I think that was problematic here in a lot of. Uh, examples on the left in the last uh, five years that when the uh, capitalists or supporters claim that they are, uh, or the state, there are no uh, money for the welfare, uh, welfare state or that we have to really lower the wages because of the competition. That's not only ideological uh, stuff. Then from the capitalist point, it, it has, uh, it, it has uh, a sense. And these problems are not resolvable on the level of, in terms of, uh, Integration of financial markets, integration of the economy to liberalize trade, they are not resolvable on the level of the uh, nation state. And just I want to indicate with this, there we are already again in the level of position of contradiction. How to uh, how to articulate coherent political uh, political position? How to respond to immediate needs of the, of the workers? And how to articulate uh, socialist uh, policy in the in the longer run? Because short term and long. Long-term positions and articulations are here uh, in uh, contradiction. I repeat, this does not mean that we have to you know, abandon the, uh, the struggle for the pride, for the for the healthcare, or for the uh, public education, or not to be solidarity with, uh, with workers that they are fighting against, against lowering uh, wages. I just want to emphasize that in terms of theoretical articulation of this of this problem and its long-term perspective. Uh, we are uh, inevitably in contradiction. We have to find a political and theoretical instruments uh, uh, to uh, to solve uh, uh, this problem, and we can solve it only by, in, fir in first instance, only solving by working on, uh, like, can you repeat that? this 
uh, uh, tactics of buying consensus to this uh, heightened rhetoric, populist rhetoric uh, about the immorality of the politicians, Serbian politicians uh, during transition. Um, uh, but also, uh, then I, I would say, and this is the thing that uh, maybe is, uh, it was a bit lacking from your uh, presentation, is that when uh, the, the politicians start going this way, uh, then uh, the, the, the way that they, uh, 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 they can enable to stay in power for a longer time uh, is very, very different. It, it isn't anymore that, okay, we have one election now and we buy the consensus through corruption, uh, uh, retirements and so on, then we buy it four years later and so on. But when you say, okay, we are not buying it anymore, we are now legitimizing ourselves on this hard uh, anti-corruption rhetoric and so on, uh, then uh, there is the, the, the implication saying uh, the things will change or the, the economy will start working because now we, are, we, we don't have the corrupted politicians in power. And uh, this is the, this is the, the kind of uh, uh, statement that is made in Serbia. And also he, he went on to say even, uh, okay, uh, maybe I'm uh, some uh, political figure like Gerhard Schroeder who will be, uh, 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 will lose the next election in four years because of the things I will do. But uh, in the end, uh, everybody will know that I was a good guy because the uh, economy will start working many, maybe not in four, but many more years or so, and, and so on. And uh, I think that uh, we, we also have to, the left has to uh, think this switch in the, in the strategy of the political parties uh, in power. Uh, like also, I, I, I would say that Orban is a case of a different uh, 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 bourgeois strategy for legitimizing the, 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 their representation of interests of capital. And uh, these other, other strategies that are appearing are maybe, uh, we, we'll, we will not be able to, uh, to tackle them only if we uh, uh, also say, like, okay, the, the 2000s period and the, uh, the, 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 the politic uh, decisions were, were bad, uh, uh, because uh, they, they are uh, not relevant. In a sense, we will just we will, we won't be able to uh, distinguish ourselves from the perspective of the uh, of the ruling parties that also say they they are bad. Uh, we have to to uh, criticize and find ways to criticize the new strategies that uh, that the political parties are are taking. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, there is lots of uh, things, but I think that this uh, somehow you indicated this uh, strategy of through, let's say, through corruption of clientelism was some kind of, somehow uh, ex explicated. Uh, it was some kind of explicit uh, program. Uh, that wasn't explicit program. They couldn't say, no, we do this because of uh, that. But the other part that you call the new strategy, this is some kind of explicit uh, uh, thing. Uh, what I wanted to say is that the political parties are, in terms of like how do they present their uh, position, because I say they really don't care especially Peripheral countries, they don't have any maneuver space for, for, for some kind of really, if they wanted to, let's assume that, any kind of uh, political intervention that would have some uh, sense in whatever uh, 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 terms. So, how, so in, in a sense, they are in this kind of um, contradiction be, between the way how they um, how they manage to, 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 to provide social consensus, how they manage to, to collect. Uh, votes and the legitimation on the one hand, and the other hand also the ideological uh, story that some kind of, that in which they function as some kind of spokesperson of, of the of the uh, bourgeoisie, and they are dealing with that situation in the, uh, the best they they, <laughs> they can. And the situation with Torban, I think it's it's interesting. It's a little bit different because of this, some uh, uh, some portions of the national uh, bourgeoisie are connected uh, to him and it, it, they have some kind of uh, power and it is kind of different, uh, different, uh, completely different uh, a different strategy, not in terms of uh, rhetoric but in terms of positioning in, in, with some, uh, with some uh, material interest. I think in, in I, I don't want to, uh, to speculate but I think now, for now, there is no, I think, uh, uh, 
material uh, space in infrastructure or any kind of uh, dead space in creation to, to, be, to have some kind of new uh, organ <laughs> only, only in, in, uh, in the rhetoric state. Okay. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I Oh, is it? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. That was a, this was an interesting panel. I think he brought uh, the uh, notion of state back into the picture. I think when you talk about class, necessarily you have to bring in the state because if you ask me, that's probably uh, debatable. But I think that's the mechanism for which uh, class uh, uh, exerts uh, domination. You, you have to have the state. To uh, accept domination. So one without uh, uh, another um, uh, cannot, cannot go together in a theoretical or historical analysis. And, and I, but I think it was a good, uh, it was a good discussion. But um, I would, I would like to formulate a political question because it was also this aspect of um, implicit aspect of you know, taking state power or organizing for uh, the uh, um, uh, politics uh, in order to take st state power and. Um, my question would be this, I don't, I don't know how to uh, formulate it uh, properly. I think uh, if you look at, uh, if you take state, for example, as an, as an entity, you, you see two connections uh, with class there. You have, uh, on one hand, you have the connection with the national bourgeoisie, the local owners of the capital, not the national uh, ruling class. But at the same time, you have a uh, connection or a subordination to the um, uh, global um, bourgeoisie, like this uh, world, what uh, called world of finance, uh, uh, global capital in general, right? Uh, and the question would be, what kind of politics, leftist politics, is able to address both uh, these connections? Because what usually is the case, or are perceived to be the case, you have this kind of politics that are addressed towards the, um, the state being uh, um, uh, under the spell of the local bourgeoisie, the local owner of the capital. And of course, then you organize for that, uh, trying to take political power uh, over but the question is, uh, what kind of leftist politics can be developed, having in mind this kind of dual uh, pressure on, on, the, on the state, or dual dependency on the, on the state? Um, and I would, I would like to bring this up uh, because you want to uh, make me think about this when you talk about uh, Croatia and the EU, for example. I think that's a very interesting example, but it's not obviously not the only case. Let's, let's think of all the states today being basically bent up and forced to remain in, uh, in contact with the global uh, sources of uh, loans, whatever they may be, I am for uh, something else. So that would be my uh, question for the discussion. For all of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, um, I agree to a certain extent, but I think that there is. Um, I think that we can fall into the trap of uh, reifying the state and, and viewing it as uh, as this discrete, unified entity. And uh, one of the points that I wanted to make is uh, that um, there are cleavages within the state. And uh, we should try to use those cleavages uh, to fight for our cause instead of viewing the state as such as our enemy. Uh, but on the other hand, yes, you do have a point with the state finance nexus and the, the whole financialization, which is the global flow, uh, and, and it cannot be avoided. So uh, I definitely cannot give any practical suggestions how to fight that part. But I think that there are uh, cleavages within states that we can use and we shouldn't fall into this uh, discursive trap of imagining the state as one unified, homogeneous entity. Because I think that is politically dangerous for us. Okay. Um, perhaps eternal, very complex question. But uh, I believe if we depart from the current situation, at least in uh, Europe, we can see that um, um, Party of European Left, as such, contains some of the most 
progressive forces like uh, Syriza, Belinke, stuff like that. But on the other hand, uh, through historical analysis, these parties uh, could be characterized as the classical social democratic parties. So it seems to me that uh, a lot more needs to be done in um, radicalizing these policies and uh, socialist uh, subjects in each European country. And the integral, integral project of uh, each such um, uh, development should be the inter internationalism. So um, it, it shouldn't be like the uh, first phase is to build a national party and then start um, uh, communicating internationally. These two things should happen simultaneously. And uh, the problem is, of course, on the international level, you have extremely strong capitalist institutions like uh, Monetary Fund, European Commission, European Central Bank, and you have nothing comparable on the labor side. I believe uh, such institutions uh, of labor power that will have international uh, potency potential should be built. At least the perspective should be such. It's a very sketchy answer, but I hope it will suffice. It's very uh, difficult uh, to have this kind of uh, answers when you, are, when you are not in position of having any kind of... Okay, we have this uh, Euro European uh, uh, left, which I'm not very fond of, but uh, it's really hard to, to imagine answers without having a political, some kind of political power and some kind of uh, social strength. It has. But uh, this problem was most uh, visible in this debate that's now maybe not so much on about uh, Greece leaving the uh, Greece in the uh, Eurozone and uh, what to do, how to, how to instrumentalize the state in that, uh, in that uh, uh, direction. And I think that the both sides were uh, right uh, in a sense in a, that debate, but the way how this will function in the future was not, I think, the, the, how it would function, let's say, if Greece uh, would, leave, uh, would leave the Euro. It's not I think, I think, of course, we have to, can, can, have to have some kind of theoretical economic expertise to arrange all of that. But I think the crucial, uh, the crucial thing that will uh, decide who will be successful or, or not are is the political strength, not only in Greece but in sense of in uh, connecting with the other uh, peripheral countries. Because within, within the state, uh, I agree with. with uh, there are some privileges that the you know, state in some terms is, is autonomous, it's not completely, that does not coincide, the state power does not coincide with the power of the uh, power of the ruling class in a sense, and there is space for, for the for the uh, working class uh, politics to engage uh, with the state. But on the other hand, and uh, we, we don't we uh, we have to have in mind all the time that the state is capital state and in a sense it's, it's dependent on the on the on the capital accumulation. You have the, uh, lots of examples where, where the left left wing uh, party came to power, and the first thing uh, uh, they have to do, if, if they want to, to realize their, their uh, welfare programs or the other uh, or the other stuff they promised uh, to the voters, they cannot do it if there is uh, if, if the process of the accumulation of capital is not successful enough. There is no uh, there is no material where they taxes of and to provide all these uh, services. So I think that that's the crucial thing that we always have to mind when, uh, when we are discussing uh, the state that is the capitalist state and is dependent on the, on the, on the accumulation. So I don't have any kind of uh, uh, answer in terms of the left politics because it's very hard for me to to, to think about these answers is, is except on some kind of theoretical levels and, and uh, locating and uh, uh, problems if, we, if there is not any kind of political uh, power that through which I can think in, 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 a, in a real terms, in terms of uh, real contradictions and the real uh, uh, enemies. Maybe that's my epistemological fault, I don't know, but it's very, very, very hard. Okay, thank you. Um, any other?
I have just a, a short question uh, for Ognev. Um, you mentioned at the end of your conclusion something like uh, that there is a task or direction for a left to make a self-management uh, uh, more productive. Am I right? Or something no, I didn't say that. Something you last one. Well, Is there a question after that, or just a clarification of? No, 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 no. It was something. Maybe if you could read the last line. I think it was the last line. Something on the left and. Um, okay, I said we must understand why the idea of the socialist self-management Yugoslav period, so the idea of the period that we have now, never acquired the mobilizing potential in the post-socialist period. So after the breakup of Yugoslavia although it almost always has a positive connotation in terms of relative material well-being. So I think that people generally think that they lived well in socialist Yugoslavia. And I think that it is time for the left in Serbia to find, or beyond, to find a way to tap into this nostalgia and make it productive. So as uh, one of the okay, mobilizing this, this is the part that I would, that wanted just to ask you to expand a bit more. Um, so what would actually be the uh, concrete uh, to use Marcos terminology, long term and short terms that uh, should somehow uh, make it more productive in that, that sense. If you were talking and to avoid this, that Ani uh, uh, said, uh, ad hoc socialism, I mean, what would actually be the task beyond this wishful thinking? <laughs> Especially if you bear in mind the reasons why self management uh, failed. It doesn't necessarily have to be self management uh, as such. I mean, the idea about self management. But, I mean, when people talk about it, they usually say, in the socialist era, that was the golden age, blah, blah, blah. I think that just uh, this positive idea can be used uh, just as a positive example. Of course, the historical circumstances cannot be copy-pasted, as, um, as someone said, I don't remember which one of you? You said, yeah, and I said. Um, but what I meant is that, and uh, this, uh, I mean, okay. First, it's really difficult for me to think politically because I'm not engaged in political struggles and I'm some, somewhat detached from the Serbian case for, for several months now. Um, but um, th this thinking of mine really was produced by some internal debates that we've been having um, on the young left, if I can call it that way, in Serbia. And uh, I think that we're, uh, in this point in time, we need to rethink how we're going to mobilize people. And uh, some of the suggestions are nationalism and rethinking the nationalist sentiment. Some of the suggestions are uh, consumption and, I don't know, popular culture, hip hop that expresses those ideas. I, to be completely honest, am not uh, satisfied with either of those strategies and that's why I think that maybe nostalgia might be uh, something analogous to those two mobilizing ideas. But as I said, it's really difficult for me to think politically and, and develop a short-term, long-term strategy with it. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Olga. Um, any other comments or questions or thoughts? Yeah. Um, maybe with, uh, to connect to your um, consideration, um, I'll try just to share the experience that was gained by our um, student movement, actually, a socialist student movement, um, who, who, who faced uh, similar difficulties and was actually able to, um, to, uh, to succeed in some, some, of, some of the mobilization of uh, the masses. Uh, so what proved to be useful in mobilization was uh, not providing some uh, abstract ideas of any sort, but um, in, uh, including people in the, uh, in the fight and actually um, succeeding in some short-term uh, struggles. So uh, actually proving uh, the people that the fight can produce some uh, results and actually building those movement out of the um, small steps and small successful steps. Um, so yeah, we somehow refer to an ace Agitirum, uh, what was it? Okay, thank you. Uh, um, Um, you said that the, the importers are the hegemonic 
contraction in the ruling class in Croatia in sense of, um, let's say, attracting the, <coughs> the capital inflows from financial institutions of the center. Uh, but uh, how do you see, how do you see the, the very clear um, role of the state and also the European Union in supporting export-oriented uh, companies um, as, let's say, restructuring legal framework, cutting taxes, subsidizing export-oriented uh, export uh, companies and so on. Do you see that a contradiction or is this... Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, things are clear from the position. That, that was the, the result that was intended during the process of the EU integration. Uh, the example of the shipyards, uh, which are now completely, uh, uh, completely uh, devastating. To, to press the state to quit any kind of subsidies uh, to the shipyards. The shipyards were the main industry which were exporting in, uh, in Croatia. And the whole logic of the, uh, of the architecture of the European, uh, European common policies in the EU, uh, European integration was in, in a sense based somehow to, to, to provide that uh, the Eastern expansion was based in a sense to provide, uh, provide a bit cheaper labor uh, as was the case with the, with, with the opening factories uh, in the Vichyard countries, let's say, German out of Valencia industry in Slovakia, or to provide uh, new markets for the products from the, uh, the vets that were, that were arranged to increase credit input that, was, that were needed for, to, to, to generate the uh, demand. So I think there's uh, no contradiction in terms of what the EU policy was, uh, was uh, from, from the uh, beginning and also that is very crucial. Uh, and this change in the institutional, uh, institutional uh, dimensions is very difficult for the left to articulate the, the position from the, within, the, uh, uh, within the national state without uh, considering all these of this uh, progress because of this uh, division of labor that I mentioned between the EU and the, uh, and the nation state. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. John, it's not good mark to say that I've seen you recently. I've seen uh, Zoran Milanovic, Croatian Prime Minister, came uh, to London to give a talk in February or March recently. And uh, he openly said, if we didn't have EU, there's no way we could have ever stopped division of labor. We could have ever stopped uh, subsidies to shipyards. And we're so glad, and it's been a great success to achieve this. But the only way for us to achieve this success of changing the <coughs> The structure of, of uh, shipyards, how they function financially, was to get the EU so that we can say it wasn't us, it was the EU who forced us with it, it was completely open about this. Thank you. Thank you. Also just, uh, just to add the, the, role of the, uh, the role of the banks that were, this, this somehow let's say the, the major point in the Croatian tradition in 1998, when the, before the banking system were stabilized by the, uh, by the state with the huge amounts of public money and there was and then and after that was uh, uh, sell to foreign uh, foreign banks the role of the banks in all these processes some, some, somehow also to recreate a new way of the global division of labor by, by its credit uh, the politics of of, uh, of credit could be credited in which way also the, the differential is between the uh, the interest rates between the core countries and uh, the countries where they came from and the countries uh, the where they now function in, in Eastern Europe. So also that you know, mechanism is uh, left Kensian Michael Hudson said once, in, in capitalism uh, also one had, uh, there is also had to be one uh, instance with planning the uh, economy. And you have the 95 or almost no, 100% uh, uh, banking sector in, in the foreign hands, you are not in position to plan uh, the economy there with their uh, politics of allocation of, uh, of, of, of credit money, they are in position to, to plan. Uh, to plan the economic uh, developments, and it, it was visible that during this period, the most of the credits went over to the households for the consumption or to the state, and the, uh, the level of the interest rates for the enterprises was uh, uh, to 
too high for the for the levels of 